Last year, I talked about an experimental film called Wavelength. It's a 40 minute shot of a wall and has an awful continuous shrieking sound that raises in pitch to the point where you want to rip your ears off. This is the kind of movie I was forced to watch in art school while majoring in film. But what about the art school movies that I actually liked? Well, I want to tell you about a favorite of mine. So when it comes to experimental films, I already talked about Jan Schwankmeyer, who made some of the weirdest movies ever, using a combination of stop motion, models, puppets, clay, and mixed media. When it comes to the surreal, he's my favorite. If you want to know more, check out my video on Jan Schwankmeyer. But I want to go back to an older era of experimental films, back when the invention of movies was relatively new and filmmakers were exploring this new exciting medium and just trying out all kinds of wacky stuff. Lots of the ones that were shown in my film classes were from the 20s. You might have heard them referred to as Dada or avant-garde films like Ghosts Before Breakfast, Entree Act, and Unchian Andalou, which was co-written by surrealist artist Salvador Dali. It has the famous shot of the eyeball being sliced, which was incredibly graphic for its time. And even now, uh, first they show a human, but then they cut to a close-up of a cow's eye. Gross. They also throw a shot of the moon in there because in these films they always like to match anything that has the same basic shape. And to this day, we still like to sometimes do these type of form cuts. So in these films, you'd see a bunch of crazy camera angles, close-ups of random objects, flipping the image and cutting back and forth, you know, weird cross dissolves and superimposed images. These films are completely nonsensical, devoid of any clear storyline, but when you watch them, you get the impression that the filmmakers were being inventive and playful in their exploits to pioneer the art of film. You could look at these films like they're a bunch of bullshit that makes no sense, or when they're at their best, I think they challenge you to interpret the plot the same way as if you were trying to interpret a dream. And I think the best of these dreamlike films is one from 1943 called Meshes of the Afternoon. It's a short film, only 13 minutes, and of all the surreal films I was shown in film class of this era, this is the one that stuck with me the most. The filmmakers were a married couple, Maya Darren, who was born in Ukraine with an American citizenship. She wrote, directed, produced, edited, and starred in it. Her husband, Alexander Hackenschmied, who was born in Austria with a Czech and American citizenship, also directed, starred, and did the cinematography. Though the roles are a little foggy, what they created together is a film that feels appropriately surreal because it seems to depict a character going through some kind of psychological stress. So all the weird occurrences are subjective of what she's going through in her mind. Long before The Shining, this is the format that so many modern horror films would eventually follow. So what's the plot or uh, what actually happens in the movie? Well, the main character played by Darren is walking to her apartment and sees a dark figure rounding the curve. She goes inside, goes to sleep in a chair, and now the same basic events are repeated in a loop, but each time we see it replay, there's certain variations. The first time around, the woman's face isn't shown, and the dark figure is off in the distance, but next time, we see it up close. It looks like a grim reaper with a mirror face. I always thought the idea of the mirror face was pretty neat. I mean, what could that mean? If you look into the Reaper's face and see your own face, does that mean you are the Reaper? And I say Reaper only because that's kind of what it looks like, a Reaper's cloak, or it could be a nun's habit, who knows. She chases the figure, only to give up, then enters her apartment, where her original self is still sleeping in the chair. So with each cycle, there's another clone of her that enters. A really cool detail is that from the window, they can see the street below where the chase happens. So she's able to witness the event that just happened, sort of like she's looking into the past. I don't know. Something about that gives me chills. It seems the woman in the chair is having the dream, but the dreams keep manifesting all these 
clones. But is the one in the chair even the original dreamer? Is there any beginning to this cycle? Or is it just an infinite loop in time? Each repetition, certain props are shown. A flower, a key, a knife, a phone off the hook, a record player. They might be random, but you get the sense they serve some kind of purpose to the story. What could the key mean? What could it be unlocking? Her subconscious mind? The kinetic camera work is the aspect I remember best and has influenced me when filming my own stuff. Take for example this shot when she leans backward into a window. The camera leans with her and next thing we cut and she's leaning over a staircase. The camera keeps rotating until we lose sense of which way is up. And the way she acts is as if she's feeling all the camera movements and it's changing her point of gravity. It makes us feel fully immersed and just as disoriented as the character. There's another great moment when she's trying to go up the steps. The camera keeps swaying back and forth and she keeps falling against the walls as if the whole building is swaying. I even imitated this shot in my own film, Cinemaphobia. As it goes on, it gets more and more tense. The mirror-faced reaper lays a flower on her bed, and that's one of the most foreboding shots so far, insinuating the idea of mourning one's death, hers perhaps? This is when she looks out the window and sees herself following the reaper. After she watches the scene play out, she takes a key out of her mouth, holds it in her palm, and it turns into a knife. Then she enters a room where two of her other selves are sitting at a table. Back then, that split screen camera trick must have looked pretty amazing. I even thought it was a big deal when I saw it in Back to the Future 2, which was made about 45 years later. In film class, we actually had to do that on real 16 millimeter film, and it was all done in camera. You would cover half the lens and then film it while counting off the seconds, and then you'd wind the film back the same amount. Then you'd mask the other side of the lens and then film the other half. So now the whole frame is filled with two exposures. If your masking wasn't perfect, sometimes you'd get a black line of unexposed film going through the middle, or you get an overlap where the two shots would like blend together a bit, which was usually more preferable. So she goes to the table, puts down the knife, which turns back into a key. They play around with it for a bit, and then the sleeping one on the chair begins to stir. One at the table turns around, now wearing weird spherical glasses. She raises a knife and walks over to her sleeping self. And then we see her feet stepping over different textures, like sand, dirt, tall grass, and carpet, as if she's traveled a great distance over several terrains just to stab herself in her sleep. But as she lowers the knife, she wakes up and now there's a man in her place. Who is the man? Besides her real life husband, is it meant to be a lover, an enemy, or what? She follows him upstairs where he lays a flower in her bed, very much in the same way as the reaper. She also sees his face in a mirror, which further hints that he is the reaper. She lays in the bed, almost as if being put to death. And as he looms over her, very sinister and predatory like, she takes a knife and throws it in his face, which shatters, creating a hole in dimensional space, revealing a beach behind. The same beach we saw her footsteps in earlier, maybe. And there's mirror fragments scattered over the sand, a masterful juxtaposition. And then the waves come up and wash them into the ocean, maybe washing away her anxieties and terrors, possibly. That would be an optimistic ending, but oh no. Outside on that same familiar walkway, the man comes walking toward the apartment with a flower again, only to find her laying in her chair, covered in seaweed, dead. It's perhaps the most disturbing corpse face in a classic film to be surpassed maybe by Psycho almost 20 years later. I don't know what any of it means, but all the events feel like puzzle pieces that have been scattered, just waiting to be put together. It might do some kind of disservice to apply some kind of solid logic to everything. Maya Darren said she wanted it to be more of an experience. And that's what it is. Depending what emotional state you're in when you see it, you can find different meanings. 
It definitely represents a lot of anxiety and obsessions over certain objects or symbols. The unanswered phone, the infinite looping record player, the knife that could cut bread or become a murder weapon. She also obsesses over places she's been, the beach, the street outside. She grasps at her surroundings, climbing around like a confused cat. She's unable to orient herself, stretching into these expressive poses like some kind of interpretive dance. Using slow motion, clever transitions, and inventive camera angles, it's what I call a masterpiece of deconstructing reality. The best of an early experimental era. It's had a great reception, it's been selected in the National Film Registry, and the BBC called it the 40th greatest American film ever made. And it was a source of inspiration for David Lynch and probably countless other filmmakers. Hey, it's only 13 minutes, so <laughs> check it out. It doesn't seem there's a lot of streaming options, but it has been posted on YouTube a number of times. It's been rescored quite a few times. Originally, it was totally silent, but then Darren's third husband, a Japanese composer named Teiji Ito, added music. And since then, there's been various versions. I'm not sure which version I prefer, but I think it's worth seeing multiple times because music makes a huge difference. So it's always a different experience. 